to the home of the Black Titanic. After Obama ordered the assassination of the leader of Gaddafi, many Africans were forced into slavery. So to escape, they took to the Mediterranean Sea where many died. This bears similarity to the Blacks who was aboard the Titanic, but there was no lifeline, so many perished and was buried under the sea. Again, welcome to the home of Black Titanic. Small villages and eking out this society, they're also Native Americans that are that are trying to escape plantation society as well, mm -hmm. out of the same area. Mm -hmm. um, we see the larger numbers, of course, coming um, after the uh, Yamasee War. Mm -hmm. now, um, and now, if I could stop you for a second, yeah. because you said you know the Native Americans um, are trying to escape plantation existence, also, right? And, and, uh, and because what has happened is they who originally occupied the land mm -hmm. now was we're having that was having their land taken away from them yeah and all not all but and then captured by those who took the land right and it's it's also more than that as well i know that's the most important thing mm -hmm. that taking your land and taking parts of your freedom mm -hmm. but also it's the encroachment of the society you see the basic problem I won't go too far on tangent there, but the basic problem between Europeans and Native Americans was property use in land right. That was the basic problem. They had two very different concepts. Right. Native Americans did not believe that you could own the land. Right. Whereas, of course, Europeans, you own what you can get or take. Right. right? I just want to say that he, when he say Native America, he's talking about Negroes, Africans. Yes, we were here first. We are the real native. And so under that, those basic um, ideologies, the conflict in those basic ideologies, we see everything else stemming from when in terms of that relationship. Right. Now, when we look at relationship between Native Americans and Blacks or Africans at this time, mm -hmm. it has to develop mm -hmm. because uh, initially all Native Americans see are these black people on their land, clearing their land. Yeah. And so they had to come to the understanding that these black people, these Africans were being forced mm -hmm. to do so. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't these Africans that were actually encroaching your land. It's actually the people who were driving the force and, and uh, were manipulating and quote unquote owning them. Mm -hmm. And so- let, 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 me, let me stop you there. Cause I, 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 I want to give the, I want to give the viewers an opportunity to see how you succinctly put this. As you heard, we talked about the definition of maroon. She said these maroon communities established close relationships with the na with the neighboring Native Americans. These two communities lived, for the most part, in harmony and provided the foundation for what would later become the Seminole Nation. I, I want to go further. Um, these. The, the culture was created by fusing various African traditions, which resulted in Pan-Africanist ethos within the community. This type of Pan-African culture existed with minimal European interference. These Pan-Africanist cultural traits manifested themselves in a variety of cultural forms that distinguished their communities from both Spanish society and Native American communities, regardless of the close proximity. Research has shown that these cultural traits were most prevalent in, com in communication, artistic expression, and religion. Yes, um, and uh, each one communication um, with the Gullah, what they did, um, and this is where we really start seeing Gullah turn into a diaspora. Because they are cohabitating, and nothing happens overnight, right? They are, they are coming down through what was considered the buffer zone then. Yeah. And of course, it ends up becoming the last 13 column to become in Georgia. Yeah. And so in that buffer zone, we start seeing a lot of Native Americans and uh, partic particularly the smaller bands 
of Native Americans, not the large ones, the Creeks, the Cherokee, but initially the smaller ones, the Hittites and the Uchi, the smaller bands, um, and those that are smaller factions out of the Yamasee, um, or Yamasee, some say. Um, what's happening is they began to uh, cohabitate a little bit, but moreover, they're beginning to uh, to find ways to communicate better with each other. So what we see is now the Gullah, the Gullah dialect, Gullah language being starting to incorporate Native American words. Mm -hmm. And so once that happens, we see a metamorphosis and we don't call that Gullah. We actually call that the Afro-Seminole Creole um, language. Okay. And so that is the mixture between Gullah, mm -hmm. which again is the West African and um, English words, mm -hmm. and now we have certain Native American words that are put into it, and that is what changes it, and that's what really puts us on that road to saying uh, Gullah is a diaspora. Mm -hmm. So now in that, right, back to the uh, relationship itself, uh, this cohabitation continues to grow yes. because plantation society is encroaching upon Native Americans mm -hmm. and it's encroaching in that they're chasing away the food mm -hmm. which means they're changing their way of life mm -hmm. and so they are also having to depend on these runaways as well to show them how to actually plant different crops, how to rotate different crops in order for sustainability now because they can't rely on the hunting that they have done for eons and years prior and, and let me interject, please, because you, when you say plantation life, I want my viewers to make sure they understand what that is. That plantation life is about enslaving people to be able to grow the plantations. Right. And, but it's also turning for Native Americans, it's turning the land mm -hmm. into an agrarian society. Yeah. All those open fields where the deer ran and the bear and the bears went where they could have plenty of food, rabbits and all of that are now being chased out because you have enslaved people who are now turning over the ground, mm -hmm. turning it all into uh, fields. Mm -hmm. And so that is also the encroachment sure. that they are losing sure. their food supply as well. Right. Right. And so they are being forced out of the area. Mm -hmm. um, they're being forced out of the area as well as um, plantation society grows. So they began to cohabitate. Now, here's, I, I, gotta have, I have to tell you this, and this, this is important, and it kind of leads back to why you also get some of these negative um, words. We've always had those general savage terms for Native Americans, but uh, the ironic thing about this particular case and the ironic thing about the Seminoles is the Seminoles are homo a homogenous group of Native Americans themselves. They are actually... <clears throat> The, the majority of them are former Creeks. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is there's a large schism in the Creek Nation. The Creek Nation breaks. Mm -hmm. You have your upper Creeks that live in northern part of present-day Alabama. They're up, of course, by the uh, mountains up in that area. And then you have your lower Creeks that are down in that corner between Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. Mm -hmm. Right? And so what happens is the, the ones in the south they began to accept plantation society. They even began to buy and trade enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And so they began to not resist plantation, but actually mm -hmm. join and work with plantation society. Mm -hmm. And so the Creeks up north were basically, what are you doing? Yeah. We don't own people. We take them as war. We hold them so we won't have to fight them again. We keep their women so we can keep our numbers up. But we don't enslave them for our own living, yeah. you know, what are you all doing? Yeah. And so there's this schism. Mm -hmm. And so the northern northern Creeks pushed themselves, pushed their way rather, through Alabama. They push through the southern Creeks and they come into Florida. Mm -hmm. And so when they come into Florida, they mix with the other Native Americans that are also running. You have the uh, Miccosukee, like I said, you have the other smaller bands. We even have some Cherokee that are leaving North Georgia and the other areas of Georgia, and they're coming um, down into Florida. These are smaller bands, though, that are kind of broken away mm -hmm. because they needed to figure out how they were going to survive as well. Mm -hmm. And so they become this homogenous group that we call the Seminoles. 
Uh, and it actually, when you look at the word and you trace it back, Semolina, Semaron, um, it has different meanings, but the main one is uh, Breakaway Creek or Renegade Creek. That's why everything you see with Florida State University and they say the um, Seminoles, they, the first thing you see up on that is Renegade mm -hmm. because that is one of the original terms for Semolina. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a negative term that the Spanish gave, Cimarron, uh, which basically meant wild beast, wild, wild dog. And of course, you can understand that it's just like anything else. When you're on the opposite, others who were the original inhabitants of the land, and every waking hour, they must be mindful of the tyranny that is coming at them with fire and fury that they have no experience with for a very long time. I'm sorry, let me jump in there first, a little point of clarification. Angola was actually a black Seminole village. It sat next to it. Mm -hmm. um, Native Americans lived outside of Angola. Uh, and you are right, you see that time and time again, um, even in, in this period with my with my book and dealing with the Black Seminoles, there are actually two other instances where um, villages are being burned, that they can just completely burn it down. And so we see um, that as a regular tactic, you know, that that is a regular tactic that was used all the way up through the 19, we can, we can trace that all the way through, all the way to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and other places that this is when communities, uh, when African American communities are uh, out of the graces, yeah. so to speak, yeah. of the larger white community, yeah. Yeah. they simply get rid of it. Yeah. And they do it by normally by just destroying the whole thing. And, and He's absolutely right. You guys know about Black Wall Street. They went in there and actually bombed Black Wall Street, burn them up. Crispy, newborn babies and all. We can talk about Rosewood, Florida. They burnt them. They burnt the, the city up. Uh, progressive black town. We can talk about the Oshani massacre. We can go all the way to Birmingham. They call Birmingham Boom, Boomingham, B-O-M-B, because of the constant bombing and and then, and the dynamites, I remember those dynamites. So anytime we have a progressive town springing up, Europeans come along, destroy it by setting it on fire. Now, we do deserve reparation, but y'all president says no. Y'all voted for that man in office. So I guess black people just like for they racist to talk nice. That's why they voted. For, for Biden, you know, but you know, Trump, he just an open racist. So which one would y'all rather have? Y'all call them the lesser of two evil. Evil is evil. If 99% of black people can get together and put that plantation on it in office, we can start our own independent democracy for ourselves and put people in office that is going to do something for us we demand reparation we all know fire is, is a pretty good tool and it's pretty quick and easy yeah so you know i don't want to jump around too much but I, but I want to do this because as i was reading it i wrote up I, I wrote in big letters the, the 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 legitimacy of the conversation of reparations. I mean, that's a that's a whole nother conversation. That's a whole nother show. But when you just go back and look at the basics here of what people had and the the slaughter that took place and the the the, the, the stealing by force of land by murder and slaughter and genocide, that issue of 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 of, of, of reparations, of reparations, just I, I couldn't get past what am I on page eighteen? It's like, man, does this ever make a case without trying to do it for reparations? And I'll tell you briefly, so we can, we can stay on topic about yeah. reparations. We have different instances. <laughs> this this is clearly a case 
Um, we have another case I'll mention in just a second. The issue is there's always been uh, opposition, right? And it, that opposition to it comes in this idea of quantifiable measurement, right? How can we quantify things if we really want to say reparations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been the biggest tool against reparations, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is we actually can. There are instances where we can quantify. Um, one in particular I always use, think about all of those years African Americans went paying taxes to state schools that they couldn't go to. Yeah. You see, so there are things that are yeah. quantifiable yeah. when we can look at record when talking about reparations. Yeah. So this whole notion about it not being able to be done because we can never quantify is that's a farce. That's that's just something to hold us off yeah. like everything else. You're right. That is another conversation. Yeah. You know. So, right. so 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 I so I. You know, I make notes here. I said, you know, the desire to be free, the desire to be free and the fear of enslavement that is going on. And I, and I just underlined something, you know, it says runaway slaves. Again, as we lead into how the, the, the free blacks, the free blacks, the runaway slaves and the, 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 the Native Americans, the natives, how they, and the, which became Seminoles and then came to the Seminole War, just leading up, leading up to that, again, is this idea of folks living, living, and being all the time in terror. They're all the time living with the sense of terror that is just around the corner because. These folks who get depicted in these movies, what they are, calling themselves United States military, calling themselves plantation society, all the rest, are terrorists. Or the militia. Or the militia are terrorists. Yeah. Terrorizing the population. And you have to understand that it's a progression as well. Yes. It's a progression. Um, that's why we ended up in three Seminole Wars, uh, because each time and we can actually see how each Seminole War directly affected the growth of Florida and Florida becoming what it is today. Um, the first Seminole War opened up plantation society for Florida. Opened up plantation society. Yeah. Opened up where land owners came in and built wealth off of slaves, off the back of slaves. And taking the land from the native man to do so, right? Uh, and so, what we see with that first, with that first war is with the first criminal war, they get to clear out the native Americans out of North Florida, uh, particularly the area from um, Tallahassee to Gainesville, because that land was considered as fertile and in some places more fertile than even Georgia. And at this time, Georgia was becoming cotton king. And so the expansion into Florida, they figured it had to be done. And so when they removed them, we see plantation society coming in, but also this is when Florida becomes a territory. Florida becomes a territory just after the first Seminole War. And so, you right, and you right. And once Florida became a United uh, became a United States possession in 1821, mm -hmm. whites were infuriated by black Indian relationship. Mm -hmm. Thus, from 1821 to 1835, relations between Seminoles and whites steadily de deteriorated. So, how dare you, inferior people, have a have a civil relationship? And not only that, continue to work together against us. Yeah. See, that's the that's the thing it does. But they gave them that common, you know, the enemy of my um, enemy. Yeah. Right. Sure. And so, um, what we see is that first war. Right, clearing out the land, Florida becoming a territory. The second one, the one that the book is based on, that ends up being a seven year war. Now, here's the issue with that we have Native Americans who are agreeing to leave, then we have Native Americans who say we're not going to leave. Um, and one in particular is Osceola. Um, he's not a chief, but because of his war attributes, he becomes a war chief. 
And so you have those who are willing to stay, who want to stay and don't want to leave. But at the same token, you have uh, your black Seminole, right? And at this point, uh, we stop calling them Maroons and we call them Seminoles because they now make a concerted effort to not only live together, we have um, familial relationships now. It usually happens at the top, but they're still doing it. They're cohabitating together. All of those good things. Right? And Mary. Yes, and yeah. marriage. It's usually done at the higher level, but um, between chiefs and whatnot, yeah. but it's, it's being done. Uh, and so at that point, right? You got two different things that are going on, right? You got the Native Americans who want to keep the land. You got the blacks who want to keep their freedom, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so when they go into this war in 1835, it is because they are fueled, of course, by the Indian removal policy uh, from Andrew Jackson, mm -hmm. uh, which spent, who, who got his political career in Florida as well. Mm -hmm. And this is where he actually got the concept to develop the um, Indian removal policy yes. by helping Florida get rid of the uh, Seminoles the first round in North Florida. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, once this happens, the war becomes evident that it is not about removing Native Americans, but it is more so about getting these blacks back into slavery. Profoundly so. Not only for the work, because there is a number that could change things in terms of work. There are large enough workforce there that could be gone, right? But not only that, not only the workforce, it is the concept, right? It's the idea that you have an area that is growing into a colony that could be a self, go from a settlement to a colony that could go to its own nation based on the fact of the opposition of slavery, meaning our slaves, as plantation, our enslaved people, yeah. right, will get the notion to go to Florida mm -hmm. because there is a black nation there. Yeah. And so what happens, uh, what we find is at the end of the first Seminole War uh, and before the second, right, toward the end of the first, um, well, actually the, the first Seminole, excuse me, let me get it straight because we want to get the timeline right. There are, There is a fourth. And it's called Negro Fort. It was left by the British yeah. to these blacks. Yeah. And for this period of time, that is a progression mm -hmm. to a nation. Mm -hmm. You start out as a settlement, mm -hmm. then you go to a colony, yeah. the colony gets a fort, yeah. then it grows and it develops, and next thing you know, you can get uh, your colony can develop into whatever else you want. If you want it to be its own country, you want it to be its sure. own nation, sure. you could. Right. And so that was by far the worst idea. That was the worst. Mm -hmm. The most troubling. Well, that was, right, that was the most troubling. That was the worst, that was the worst scenario. Let's say that, that'd be better mm -hmm. to say. That was the worst scenario for plantation society to have these because as long, they figured as long as they were down there in Florida living free, then they would always have to watch theirs and they would just continuously run right. and then plantation society would start to demise. Mm -hmm. And they all and some even express the ending of plantation society mm -hmm. if this continues to go on in Florida, mm -hmm. that this would end plantation and so society. That, that's something I wanted to uh, examine here, um, because now you're saying, you know, we're 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 into the first war, um, this is a contemplation of the second. Um, but in the meantime, there had been some agreements. There had been, in, 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 for those for those who agreed to move out, there had been treaties. Right. There, 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 two main treaties. There had been, there had been agreements. Mm -hmm. And how did those who were the oppressor handle those treaties? Um, well, they were lopsided. <laughs> like it is, they were lopsided treaties. Uh, the first one that got the uh, Seminoles removed out of North Florida, uh, pushed them down into Central Florida, um, around the area between present-day Orlando and Tampa. And when they got down there, uh, many of them didn't like the land. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lakes in that area, swampy. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, Native Cause, Americans didn't care for them. Again, in terms of lo 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 logistics here, they were occupying the most fertile land where they had where they had coastline. See, that's where they were able to not only the yeah. coastline yeah. and that land just below Georgia, where basically cotton yes. cotton is becoming king. Yes. Where that fertile land that was making cotton become king in mm -hmm. Georgia, mm -hmm. some of that land extended itself in the North Florida. Mm -hmm. And so they just really were concerned about the northern portion sure. where that land was the sure. best. Right, right. And so where one, people people where, where the natives were occupying. Right, there was there was Seminole land. Yeah, here. and so so therefore you got to go off there and go over go. to some land that's not nearly as fertile, not nearly as productive. Nowhere near. Right. And so they some took the agreement, they took the buy, they took the payment, all of that good stuff. Went down into the area, went down into the area, and then realized how bad the land was, how rough it would be to start over down there. And so many of them started returning. They came back saying, no, nah, we're not going for that. Yeah. You all, you know, you pulled a flim flam with that. Yeah. We're not going for it. Yeah. And so then we see other negotiations coming, mm -hmm. right? And so they, the Indian removal policy is starting to, to take place nationally. And Jackson is coming into office. He becomes president. So this Indian removal policy is going nationwide. Mm -hmm. And so then the offer then came to actually go out west. Yeah. And see that because that's what they would do. They would take Native Americans who are out west and they bring them to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. This is how Geronimo ends up in Florida. Mm -hmm. They bring Geronimo to Florida and they take Osceola and take him out west mm -hmm. to present day Oklahoma, which back then we called the Arkansas Territory. Right. And so when this happens, right, mm -hmm. when they start coming back, they say, no, this is not going to happen. Then they show them the land out west, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Again, Native Americans are split. Mm -hmm. Some Native sure. Americans say, right. take the buyout because they're going to kill us all. Mm -hmm. do, oh, do we really want to be the ones responsible for, you know, ending our, our existence? And then you have the blacks, mm -hmm. right? The blacks see that land as an opportunity. When they go out to the Arkansas Territory and their, you know, the Black Seminole leadership goes out there with the Native American leadership and they look at that land, they see it as an opportunity. The problem is the government didn't have that land in mind for them. It was just for the Native Americans. They had planned to round up all of the Black Seminoles and return them to slavery. To slavery. Yeah. And so once this was evidently clear, right, that is what brought the unifying effect in again. Mm -hmm. So even those who were willing to go said, oh, no, we're not going without them. Yeah. Because some of them were their children. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. of them were their wives, their husbands, yeah. grandchildren. Yeah. So they were like, no, we, we're not going out there without them. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is negotiations start falling apart. And we end up in a, in that second war. Okay, and I, I, I'm glad you say there. You bring it to the negotiated fall part. We're in the second war because this time is going by extraordinarily fast. I knew we needed hours for this, but we now, just because of the clock, need to get to the the, the, the that that second war, which is okay. the, which is the focus here. And and I think I'd like to examine it in part by calling out three names: Abraham. John Caesar and John Cavallo, who was better known as as, as Go for John. These are these are Africans who goes on to become even more known as John Horse. That's right. So if you could kind of through their eyes take us or take the audience now into this war, what what was that what was that risk? Why they were fighting and what the results were. Okay. So by the time we get, by the time we get to the 1830s, um, Andrew Jackson is in office. Uh, things have just deteriorated to the point where they are fighting now. Uh, you have three major bands. Uh, there is what we call the St. John's Band, which is St. John's River, uh, which is on the East Coast, 
Uh, and the main city on the St. John's River is Jacksonville. Most people think Jacksonville is on the coast. It's actually on the river. Um, and so that's one band. The second band is what we call the Gainesville band, which is Gainesville, uh, central, north, central Florida. Um, it's a little closer to Jacksonville, but we consider it, um, well, a little closer, but it's on your way between Tallahassee and Jacksonville. So, and so, and that's basically north, central Florida again. And then you have your third band, which is in the Tampa area. When they get pushed down Angola, uh, that's the Tampa Bay area. So you got your three bands. All right. Each one of those men you named represented one of the, the bands in the area. Yes. John Caesar was the oldest because he came out of the oldest area, which was St. John. Because, of course, when the um, initial enslaved people began to run away and abscond, they came straight down the coast, straight into St. Augustine. So they stayed around the St. John's River. All right. John Caesar was a, uh, he was an older, older gentleman. We figure him, we have no, no pictures of him or anything. But we figure him to be um, early 50s at best, mid 50s, early 60s. His job was recruitment. He was the best recruiter. He would go on doing what we call plantation raids. Yes. He would raid, raid the plantation for supplies, guns, horses, cattle, all that good stuff. But then he would convince others to run away. Again, because of the clock. So he just has to we got four minutes left. Oh, but well, I, I can only, do it. Only four minutes left. I can do it. I need you to. <laughs> I wish you would have given me the five minute numbers. I would have run it in. Okay. But very quickly, mm -hmm. Caesar dies John um, Caesar, yes. because he's doing these plantation raids mm -hmm. in 35. Mm -hmm. It's his plantation raids that get the war going. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so Caesar dies. He's an older. Like I said, he was going back and forth. He had his wife was still on the plantation. So we ascertained that she was probably um, a cook or something in high visible. That's why she could never run away. And then in the in the uh, Gainesville band, we had what we call our primary um, black Seminole chief, and that was Abraham. Right. And he was the advisor or the chief. Um, this is a, this is this a, is Abraham. This 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 is Abraham right here. Y'all need to know about Abraham. He is the he's the chief black Seminole, yeah. um, especially after Caesar dies in thirty five. He yeah. takes over. Um, he's the negotiator. Yeah. He speaks because Nicanope doesn't speak English well. Chief so he, right, right. Chief mm -hmm. mm -hmm. doesn't speak English well. Mm -hmm. So he's the main person negotiating yeah. um, with the government mm -hmm. and with um, the United States. And then there's a third band, and that's John, go for John, mm -hmm. John Horse. Right. He's a lot younger. Mm -hmm. He's in his twenties. Uh, but he is the son of a Seminole Native American chief. But because his mother is black, he's still considered a black Seminole. He sure. doesn't belong sure. to sure. a band. Right. I mean, he doesn't belong to one of their bands. Mm -hmm. All right. So what happens is Abraham is the leader in Florida during the war. Mm -hmm. But John, because John Horse is a lot younger, he's also who he's right hand, his right hand is places him in a higher category. Mm -hmm. He's Osceola's mm -hmm. advisor. Mm -hmm. He's Osceola's right hand. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I, I want to say this quickly, I think Osceola doesn't get the recognition that Geronimo, mm -hmm. Sitting Bull, and Chief Joseph gets mm -hmm. is because of who he was. Mm -hmm. He had a black Seminole wife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most of the people in his, his band, his war band, mm -hmm. were black Seminoles. Mm -hmm. So, so, so in these last 90 seconds, mm -hmm. I'd like for you to share, again, what was the, you characterized this as the most successful slave rebellion. Yes. Um, talk about what was at stake and what was accomplished. Okay. Uh, what was at stake, of course, was re-enslavement and enslavement for some, because we're talking two and three generations now. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're talking people who yeah. had never known slavery now, just their grandfather. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that is, of course, the most important thing, yeah. right? But it was also the growth, the growth of plantation society itself. Yeah. Uh, we can trace, and I say it very quickly, each Seminole War opened up Florida and plantation society. Uh, 
or a Florida society period mm -hmm. by the time we get to the third. First Seminole War, two years after the First Seminole War ends, Florida becomes a territory. Mm -hmm. Then we have the Second Seminole War, 1835-1842. Three years later, after the Second Seminole War, after they decide that, okay, the blacks can go out west, we won't re-enslave you, which gives them the victory, why I say it's a successful sure. rebellion, sure. Florida becomes a state. Mm -hmm. Florida becomes the 45th state. Mm -hmm. And then the Third Seminole War, they wanted to open up South Florida. Uh, they were even crazy enough to think that they could drain Lake Okeechobee uh, just to flush them out. Sure. And so they went into a third war that ended in 1858. That war ended because they felt like the Seminole numbers were low enough that they didn't have to worry about them impeding progress. So they were re really able and ready to go into South Florida. But of course, this ends in 58. They leave the Union, they go into the, and by 1861, they end the war. And for those, and so, for those who were being, were genocide was being practiced against, yeah. they had to make the decision. Stay here and fight and know that we're going to be slaughtered or agree to move on. Right. And they move on and they live. And that's what kind of um, changed Abraham's leadership, yes. right? Because he has to negotiate. Yes. And of yes. course, they don't, you know, when you negotiate, some people are not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. But the best thing was to negotiate that move to the Arkansas Territory, present day, uh, present day uh, Oklahoma. Yes. So we end it as you can see. This is not taught in history book. Our ancestors have always fought slavery. We have always fought, but the biggest revolution, the most undefeated, was the Negro Seminoles. They had three wars against them, and they still couldn't defeat the Seminoles. Yes, you guys. Our ancestors has always fought. Yeah, we fought all the way up to the 60s we were fighting. Hey, y'all, Maurice is righteously so defending his loved one. Now, some people are so inconsiderate. They came for Kimmy. And one person said, what's the chop necessarily needed? Or was it suggested to promote Oprah Winfrey hair show? Maurice clapped back. He said she made the decision to share her. She well, she made the choice to share her decision with the world. Just like you should make the choice to move the F off, off this post. My wife is currently going through it and ain't um, and I ain't here for it. Move on. That's right. Move on. Move the F on. That's what you should have said, Maurice. But righteously so, he should be defending his wife. And Kim, and, oh, you had a you got a beautiful head of hair, and you're very beautiful. So we wish you well. Get well soon, Cammy. So they're on the yacht, right? Little sugar mama is got the little microphone, uh, trying to sing to her dad, and he looks like he gets mad at sugar mama for trying to sing the song. And Mel will throw them tell sugar mama, no, 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 just don't sing. But listen, listen at this, you guys. He's gonna start remembering. Well, I don't know if he remembering, but um. On network, gonna bring the pass up. So let's just listen to this. And if this does not happen, it's gonna seem like I made them a promise that I didn't uphold. And that's not what I'm trying to do. They will be devastated if we don't get out of this water on this yacht. There's a storm coming, baby. Imagine we go into the storm and the boat starts rocking really hard or anything, right? We want to live, right? We do want to live. Huh? Let me come on over here and get karaoke. Don't 
she's they want to do karaoke and then Mel is saying can we play one of my songs so that upsets him uh why you want to even mention it Mel? and he has this this look on his face of disgust at Mel. But the bottom line of it is the kids, you know, the children are excited. Little Sugar Mama is right in front of him, ready to perform, but he's not having it. Let's listen. It is like, I see, she does, it's, I'm asking, I I've already told her no. I'm asking, this is funny. Is, is it funny? I definitely would say I've come a long way since Las Vegas. In that heated discussion, we're talking about Mel's song. You put this song together, you were talking about the boys. I remember you, you and my kids walking around the house singing two years ago. Shut up, shut up, shut up. But now, you know what So, y'all, y'all know this man got a lot of nerve. He's got a baby and a mistress at this time. It's all in Mel's throat, all on social media. Uh, a dog and male out and he mad at a song. He cussing her out over a song, you guys. He do not take accountability of, of for anything. He's not even considering, well, my wife made this song to heal. So I think, I don't know which one it is, but y'all know when she got the side chick of the year award and telltale sign. So He's not, he don't want the kids to sing at all. But anyway, uh, males start to communicate. Okay, well, I, I respect your belief. I told her no, but he still got an attitude. All right, let's hear what he's going to say in his, his uh, confession. Now, let's just, he acting like he's paranoid. He says, what are the three types of paranoia? Uh, paranoia is generally considered the most common type. Grandiosity paranoia is common too. But anyway, a paranoid is a form of narcissism, you guys. That's what they say that he has. Paranoid phenomena can be seen to arise from pathological narcissism. This is what we're listening at as a result of certain kinds of trauma to the ego. Now that son was trauma, trauma to his ego, you guys. And, and also being on this trip it is trauma to his ego too, because Mel is li living this lifestyle that he can't afford. Also, Mel is living a lifestyle that she was affording with him also. So, you know, that's trauma to his ego. Yeah, because he's going around telling everybody that, you know, he was the breadwinner. He the primary, the dominant breadwinner. So breadwinner, you guys. So anyway, as a result of certain kinds of trauma to the ego, idea, or losses of important things, or losses in a, in a relationship, so the self become dislodged from internal agency and representation. So inside of him right now, he's feeling demasculated. Yes, he no longer on this trip can go back and tell pathological lies that he supported this woman and his children on all this trip. But anyway, as y'all can see that that song was was part of his ego, you know. He he didn't know how to deal with with melody. He's so used to coleslaw, you know. Cause I know in one of his confections he said that coleslaw made him feel smart. Let's finish listening at this paranoia narcissism. Listen, I put my kids first, put their feelings first, their happiness first, me wanting to be in a better place in Melody. And I think that is growth. If we're trying to get to a happy place for the children, I don't think the negative songs about their father is a good jump off or a good start. I think it's, it's, it's tacky. Okay, 
love you guys so you can't make this stuff up meanwhile the mistress is watching she knows that her her boyfriend Martel has went on a family vacation with his ex-mistress with his ex-wife she have tried so hard to make this woman disappear. She thought this woman was gone out of this man's life. But up pops a vacation that they went on. Martel goes on a vacation, as y'all can see. But she's not going to take it laying down. She's going to start taunting uh, the little host kids. You're the host kids. Make my baby not sick. Uh, he always um, be the friend towards me. I can't love you. They don't mean I'm here. Girl, listen. Anybody on here, because it took for me a long time. A two. Okay. It took me a long time to understand this. That everybody is a good friend. Everybody's going to like you. It's going to be a woman who just got cheated on last night who's going to take her life insecurities out on you, Ariana. You have to be prepared and you have to be able to understand that this lady is going through some things. That's why I don't judge y'all no more because y'all shouldn't judge me. Y'all should know. Hey, my twin. Am I dating? I definitely have a boyfriend. I sure do. You don't want to be on social media because he said y'all do too much. You know, he says I'll do too much. I never want to be on social media, but I ain't never put nobody on social media unless we get married. Because you post your nigga, next thing you know, you with a new bitch. Then you looking like. That <laughs> pissed me out. So y'all gotta be careful. Latoya, look it. I love that C Shout. They need to hurry up and come out with that um, reunion tour. What are they playing with us for? Every single time, every single time Shave Room dropped and Beyonce is coming out with some new music or something, it's give me in the comments. I need for a reunion tour. We need Michelle. We need Beyonce. And we need Kelly. And DC, y'all really need to drop it back to say my name. And y'all need to bring everybody. We need Sarah. <laughs> we need the whole tour. You know, the people don't be wanting to make their money. <laughs> but I'm ready for that Jesse Shaw reunion tour because I'm definitely gonna be following. Say my name, my name. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and I'm glad that you guys could think this guy is. No, it's not worry because I got a lot to moment. You are always saying the funny things. Perhaps you can say them at my warming up house party tonight. I will not. Parties are useless and take up. Not look like it looks like me, his mom. My son do look like me, he got my eyes. Are you okay, son? My son got sick from his sibling. Unfortunately, he's not in daycare. He doesn't start daycare until August, so he got sick from being around his sibling, who's already in daycare. My poor son. Oh, same mama saying. Oh, my kids around him. So as you can see, this mistress right here is trying to start something with the host kids. She's jealous because the whole kids has a life that her child does not have. Anyway, the way both the husband and the mistress, they don't face reality. Martel and, and, and uh, Arian both don't face reality. But she's always probing at his wife. Oh, yeah, you, you know, that's a dig at Melody. Your kids that made my kids sick. So you would think that uh, a mistress always posing at your wife or probing at your wife will scare the married man off. 
But no, not this married man, because he's a narcissist. It's all about him, and he had no accountability, no feelings or anything by what he's taking his wife and his children through. And she don't either. Yeah. So the other woman, does the other woman start to truly feel remorse? Well, her example of remorse is what she said in the beginning. Somewhere, some of you wives are all here upset, think that someone, some other young woman going to take your man. That's her, but you know, I guess that's her feeling of remorse. But for sure, both Martel and and Arian was in denial, yeah, about who was really the breadwinner. And Aaron was in denial to think that this man was going to marry her, you guys. So the brutal truth is, the brutal truth is that this man has lost his family for this woman, this chick right here. And then the brutal truth is that he says that this woman is a fit mother and Melody is not. This girl is sitting up on social media this boy sound like he had COVID, y'all, or pneumonia or something. And at this point, it's been well over a month that all of the fans and the people been so upset with her because she would be on social media while this boy can't hardly breathe. Rather than hate Martell for putting her through the situation that she helped contribute to, she hate the wife. Yes. She feel like she doesn't deserve my tail. That's another defense mechanism. She felt like she is the better woman. I'm MF. Uh, I'm MF Curry. Yeah. I took him with my eyes closed. Yeah. That's what she found out. Then she started finding excuses just like like uh, Martel did. Martel says that his excuse for being with us because Melody was not doing things with him. Well, Martel, I want to know how did you get all those babies if, if, if Melody wasn't doing anything to you? The mistress is able to justify her but This mistress justify her behavior by saying something along the lines, she hasn't been treating him right. She doesn't appreciate him like I do. Of course, that's what she feels like. Martell is in love with me. While the other woman hates the wife, the truth is she wished that she had this man all to herself. The truth is she wished that she had Melody like she even have had this baby and she thought that that was going to be the gold mine for her. But now she's still mad at Mel because she feel like Mel is standing in the way of her own happiness. Yeah, this mistress right here deserves the sad chick of the deal award. That's right. She didn't see it coming. It backfired on her. She's no longer on social media coming to I took the man with my eyes closed. Yeah.